Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining with us on this uh, sixth Sunday of the Easter season. And we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And with your spirit. My friends, the Easter season is rapidly coming to a close. Next week, we celebrate the Feast of the Ascension. The following week, the uh, Feast of Pentecost itself. And therefore, there has been an increasing focus on the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. Jesus tells us that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Let us ask his mercy this morning for those times when we have failed to do so. I confess to Almighty, Almighty God, God and, and to you, my brothers and sisters, and sisters that I have greatly sinned, sinned in, in my thoughts, thoughts and, and in my words, and what I have done and what I have, what I have failed, failed to do. Through, through my fault, through my fault, through my, fault, through through my, my most grievous fault. fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary of a Virgin, Virgin, all the angels and saints, and, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Lord, have Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. And let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, that we may celebrate with heartfelt devotion these days of joy, which we keep in honor of the risen Lord, we may, and that we may relive in remembrance, we may always hold to in what we do. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ to them. With one accord, the crowds paid attention to what was said by Philip when they heard it and saw the signs he was doing. For unclean spirits, crying out in a loud voice, came out of many possessed people, and many paralyzed and crippled people were cured. There was great joy in the city. Now when the Apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for it not, had not yet fallen upon any of them. 
They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope, but do it with gentleness and reverence, keeping your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who defame your good conduct in Christ may themselves be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that be the will of God, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once, the righteous for the sake of the unrighteous, that he might lead you to God. Put to death in the flesh, he was brought to life in the spirit. The word of the Lord. spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you always, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot accept 
because it neither sees nor knows him. But you know him, because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live and you will live. On that day, you will realize that I am my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me, and whoever loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. The Gospel of the Lord. Cain and I are more and more fighting with each other. It decides it wants to fall down all the time and take a rest. A young man's father had been hung for some crime. Now this young man was faced with filling out a life insurance form with the usual questions that we encounter. Usual questions on health, hereditary diseases, things like that. When it came to answering, how did your parents die? He put down, mother by pneumonia. Father was taking part in a public function when the platform gave way. Truth? Yeah. Full truth? Not really. According to Robert Browning, truth is truth and justifies itself by, an, by undreamed ways. St. Augustine makes the statement, it is written, for God is light, not light seen by these eyes of ours, but that which the heart sees upon the hearing of the words. He is the truth. We make our claim as Christians, as Catholics, that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, the truth. And we express that truth in a variety of ways. For a Roman Catholic, there are certain beliefs, truths, practices, values that we hold. The existence of God, the fact of the Holy Trinity, the fact that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, the reality of a future life, the fact that we can interpret scriptures as Directives for daily living, a code of morality, in that we acknowledge the central importance of the sacraments in our spiritual lives. We see those as basic truths, basic values, that in one degree or another we all hold uniformly. But the question still comes up on that uniform, uniformality. How do we view those truths? How do we agree to them? How do we adhere to them? How do they define who we are? Make us unique? How much credence do we put to them? By credence I'm talking about how much do we really reflect on those truths? How do they touch us? Not just on the surface, but interiorly. How do they change us? Are they merely things that we have to do? So as an adult, we see them as a necessary responsibility. But we really truly haven't entered into them to understand them, to really permit them to permeate all of the aspects of our lives. As teenagers, do we see ourselves being forced into them? Sort of that attitude that, okay, I'm going to go to church because mom and dad insist on it until I've been confirmed, and then I'm done. I don't have to go to class or anything else. I'm now a mature Catholic. Peter, the first pope, makes a statement. To be a Christian is a personal interior commitment to Jesus Christ. He has the central place in our hearts and therefore within our lives. 
The focus of Christian life, therefore, is belief, baptism, and conversion. Very much like we see with the people in Samaria who are now responding to the, the first words that they hear about Christ from the early missionaries. And then, later, individuals who sent from Jerusalem who actually baptize them. This is a very personal process. First you have the belief. Baptism in the Lord's name, then in spirit. It's a personal interior acceptance of the truth. I hear it, I reflect on it, and by God's grace, I permit it to begin to take hold. And in that process, I am making a commitment to it. And then baptism, a personal, public, sacramental expression of belief. In its ideal, this leads to a changing of our behavior, a changing of our lifestyles. We begin to live differently from the way we did previously. That is the ideal. That is the expectation of what's going to happen. Now, obviously, this is very much a personal process for an adult who is entering into the church to be baptized. For a child, an infant, it's a little bit of a different process. We still expect to see that development of a uh, characteristics in their lives, but this is going to be based more and more not so much on a conversion experience where they're changing from where they had been living, that's not the case, but they're going to begin to take these on, these characteristics of a Catholic, of a Christian, because they see them being lived within their families and within the community that they are growing up in. The problem is that a lot of times that water that has been poured over our heads or the oil that has been smeared on our chests or on our foreheads doesn't really penetrate. It's a lot like the heavy rains that we have down here, the ones that will drown a frog. But if you dig in the soil after the rain has stopped, it's only wet maybe an inch deep, and then powder dry underneath. The effect of the baptism is not magical. It's one where we've opened ourselves up to it, like the Samaritans did, and permit that grace to begin to enter into our lives, to begin that process of change. So some questions. Have we truly ever really heard and listened to the Christian message? Yes. Week after week we gather here in the church, or like we are right now, you gather in your homes and watch this on the live streaming. But we truly listen to the words. What are the words actually saying to us? Words are powerful, but only if we open up our minds and our hearts to them. Have we truly been evangelized and responded positively? to that evangelization process, like the Samaritans that we read about in the scripture? Or have we simply accepted Christianity as part of the cultural surround, the background noise in our lives? Have we seriously and maturely considered the Christian message as a real option in our lives, one where, where we are making the conscious choice to listen to it, come to understand it, come to adhere to it, accepted it deliberately and consciously? Or did our learning process stop when we left the Catholic school or the CCD programs or the religious ed programs that we were a part of? Do we live at all Christian lives but still with childhood guidelines? We only spout pious platitudes. Or can we explain our beliefs and its values? Verbally explain it to people who are curious, interested, even attacking us. Can we do it quietly, patiently, with tolerance? Do people see it actually being lived out in our lives? There's an old saying attributed to St. Teresa of Avila that a lot of people understand and have heard. You might be familiar with it. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks with compassion on this world. Change the wording just slightly. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do well. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet. You are his eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. 
Yours are the eyes through which he looks with compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Jesus speaks to us today in the gospel about still being alive, even after his death. Mostly we find Jesus alive in the love of others. The energy of love that is connected to the energy of God, for God is love. At other times we find God close to us in prayer. But where we can sense him alive most clearly, most definitively, is in the ordinary, extraordinary loves of every day. In marriage, in family, in friendship, in the care of others. And during a time such as this, that comes forward or should be coming forward most clearly for us. Many of us do not realize that in this way, we have been Christ bearers. In listening to another, in care of all sorts, in putting ourselves out for the other, in working for justice and for peace, the Spirit of God is alive and people are touched by God's love through the cooperation of ordinary men and women, you and I. That is one of the challenges that we have as we come to the end of this Easter season, as we hear more and more about the Holy Spirit entering into our lives. That is not a superficial action. It's one where we fully open ourselves up to that spirit, to its wisdom, to its guidance. And we'll hear more about that next week with the Feast of the Ascension, definitely when we enter into Pentecost itself, of the impact of that spirit on people's lives, the lives of the people in the early community of the church, at first small community that we read about in the Acts of the Apostles. We see it blossoming in the lives of the great men and women that we see as our saints down through the centuries. We see it in the lives of the ordinary people that we encounter, who quietly go about living their lives, living their faith on a day-to-day basis, and in the process, witnessing to the truth of that faith. We must do whatever we can to fully understand what this faith is about not just superficially, not just relying on platitudes, really truly understanding how it challenges us, because it should challenge us on a day-to-day basis. And why do we do that? Because we may be the only gospel our neighbors ever encounter. Having heard God's word proclaimed, we join together and profess the faith we hold in common. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all all things things visible visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, God, born of the Father before all ages, ages. God God from God, God, light from light, light, true God God from true God, God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the Holy Spirit, was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. He rose again on the third day, day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated, seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This morning, prompted by the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God our Father. Our response is, Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. May the leaders in our church continually witness to faith hope and love in their decisions and dialogue. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, graciously hear us. May the leaders of nations choose peace and give their people reasons for hope, especially those who are poor and oppressed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, graciously hear us. May through the gift of prayer we be open to the revelation of God in our lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, graciously graciously hear hear us. May the Father strengthen us with the Holy Spirit, that our lives may be for others a witness to God's healing presence in the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, graciously graciously hear us. 
May the Lord open our hearts to recognize and welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit in all those we meet. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord graciously Lord, hear us. May we thank the Lord for the gift of the Spirit of Truth and always have the courage to walk in the paths of truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord graciously Lord, hear us. May the Lord keep us mindful of the commandments so that our day-to-day -day lives make, a, make real the commandment to love those we encounter. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. May there be a quick containment and eradication of the coronavirus pandemic. May the medical professionals be guided by your holy wisdom in providing treatment and developing immunization techniques. And we, may we all not respond in fear, but take the reasonable and responsible approach to protecting ourselves and each other. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. May those struggling with sickness in any for disability, terminal illness, infection by the coronavirus among our families and friends within this community or within the wider community in which we live, especially those listed in our prayer, prayer list. May the Lord fill them with hope and comfort and strengthen their families. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. May our deceased relatives and friends, especially William Hill, Anthony Morbito, Gary Schuchert, Robert Gerlinger, Peaches O'Connor, Diane Adcock, Bridget Goodwin Moffat, Barbara Shanley, Orlando Gianni. As we pray for the repose of their souls, we remind ourselves that through the Eucharist, we are united with the whole family of the church, both living and dead. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. For these and for all of the intentions we hold within the privacy of our own hearts. We pray, Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear, us. hear us. Heavenly Father, deepen our faith in your unfailing love for us. Grant the prayers that we make to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed, blessed be God, God forever. forever. And blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed, blessed be God, God forever. forever. With humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord. May our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. Wash me, O Lord, of my iniquity. Cleanse me of all of my sins. Thank you. My sisters and brothers, let us pray that my sacrifice and yours may be found acceptable by God, our Almighty Father. May, may the Lord, Lord accept the sacrifice, sacrifice of your hands, my hands for the praise and glory of his name, name, for our good and for the good of all of his holy church. And let us pray. May our prayers rise up to you, O Lord, together with the sacrificial offerings, so that purified by your graciousness, we may be conformed to the mysteries of your mighty love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them up, up to the Lord. Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right and, just. and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But in this time, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. By the oblation of his body, he brought the sacrifices of all to fulfillment in the reality of the cross. And by commending himself to you for our salvation, showed himself the priest, the altar, and the lamb of sacrifice. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exalts in your praise. And even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts Sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord God of hosts, hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Barry, our Bishop, and all those who hold into the truth and on the Catholic and the apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, where they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with these, in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, and John. Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogenus, John, and Paul, Cosmas, and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, what are our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice, in his holy and venerable hands. And once more, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. 
For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, Lord, and and profess your resurrection resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given to us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offerings of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, and Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy thy will be done, on earth as as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, bread, and and forgive us our trespasses. trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the the kingdom, kingdom, the the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Peace Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy, have mercy on us. On us. Lamb, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. peace. May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, through your death gave life to the world. Free me by this, your most holy body and blood, from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me always faithful to your commandments. Never let me be parted from you. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. healed. 
May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. Amen. May the blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who restore us to eternal life in the resurrection of Christ, increase in us, we pray, the fruits of this Paschal Sacrament, and pour into our hearts the strength of this saving food, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the last day of the coronavirus novena. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, have mercy on us and on the whole world. We come to you today with our fears and concerns. You know what's in our hearts. We love you, trust you, we need you. We ask you to be with us, stay with us, help us through these times of uncertainty and sorrow. We know that you are the divine physician, the healer of all. 
And so we ask that you bring your loving and healing presence to all those who are sick and suffering right now. Please comfort them. Please be with the grieving families of those who have passed away. Please have mercy on those who have died. May they be with you in heaven. Please stand at the side of all medical professionals who are putting themselves at risk while they work to bring healing to others. Lord, as we, Lord, we are scared and we are sorrowful. Please help us send us your peace and overwhelming presence. And a moment for your own intentions. Mary Andur of Knots, please pray for the knot of this virus to be undone for the greater glory of God. Jesus, we thirst for you. You chose to enter this world as a vulnerable baby. Be with the most vulnerable now. Help us to continue to return to you with our whole hearts throughout this ordeal. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And let us bow our heads and pray for God's blessing. May you know the safety of God's love. Amen. Amen. May you be aware of the presence of Christ in your hearts. Amen. Amen. May the comfort of the Holy Spirit be always about you. Amen. Amen. May the blessings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you today and in the days ahead. Amen. Amen. To go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God. This is a point at the Mass where I would normally ask if you were here in the church, if you would all please be seated because we need to talk. So, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I would ask you just pause here for a minute. I'm going to take a little bit of time. Uh, one, um, upcoming events. This coming Thursday is the traditional feast of the Ascension. In the old days, it was a holy day of obligation. Now in our diocese, in many dioceses, that uh, feast day has been transferred to Sunday. However, in recognition of the old traditional day of the Ascension, on Wednesday evening, our prayer service will focus in on the Ascension itself. So uh, that will begin as we have in the past at 6.30 with uh, quiet time for yourselves. At 7 o'clock, we'll begin the prayer service that will run, and when it's completed, whatever time is remaining up until 8 o'clock, once again, will be quiet time for yourselves. So that will be on Wednesday evening. Um, today, immediately following this Mass from 9.30 until 12 noon, they are collecting food out on the uh, portico around the bell tower. Once again, like uh, a couple of weeks ago when food was delivered here by you all, out of your generosity, to help uh, restock the shelves at Prince of Peace and also at the Chesapeake Food Bank. So uh, once again, we're asking for your help in that endeavor. And uh, ahead of time, thank you very much for your concern, for your generosity. Uh, the other point that I wanted to raise with you all, um, the word is already circulating rapidly in the, in the parish about reopening the church this coming weekend, next weekend. And I just want to clarify a few points that have been out there. One, uh, you all heard the report from the, from the governor and his uh, criteria. There were three pages of requirements that he had for churches to begin the process of reopening on a very small level. Last week, we finally received the uh, interpretation and the application of those by our bishop to all of the churches here in the diocese. And we have been given a few days to put together our own plans based on his requirements on how we're going to implement his requirements here in our church, his, the bishops. Uh, I think there's been a little bit of angst that this was not done consult consulting the entire parish on it. Let me explain it this way. In this book that I have up here in the front, the Roman Missal, that is used to celebrate all of our liturgies, there is red print rubrics. Those are the guidelines that I have to follow when I celebrate Mass or do the sacraments. In effect, the bishop's guidelines are rubrics. There was not any give or take. It was, how are we taking those rubrics and applying them here? Therefore, we did not do a lot of consulting. We took those and applied them to our situations as we've experienced them here over the years. Clarification. Uh, everyone will have to wear masks. It's going to come across as uh, a little annoying the uh, procedures that we have to follow. Uh, and the portico, there will be ushers who are going to be pointing out the major questions that apply to COVID-19 
asking if any of these apply to you. If they do, when you're here next Sunday, we're going to ask you to leave. Uh, if you do not have a mask, you are not permitted to come into the church. Um, we have been required to determine what is the acceptable number of people that we can have in this church. Originally, it went from our uh, normal capacity cut in half. And then you took that half and you cut, cut it down even more to provide uh, spacing, the six-foot spacing. So basically, we come down to about 190 people can be fitted into this church for any one mass, at least for the immediate future. How are we going to be addressing that? Tomorrow morning on our uh, webpage, in that, you can go there to Sign Up Genius and you can register yourselves in. And we will register you specifically into being here in attendance at one of the two masses that are going to be celebrated next weekend. And the people out on the portico will use that listing as the criteria for admitting people into the church for mass. So please go to Sign Up Genius and register in for that. 190 seats roughly is what we're going to be able to fill. Um, you are going to be escorted into the church by an usher. We will fill the church from the front to the back. Uh, spacing is required. The center sections are going to be for families. Different arrangement for families as opposed to individuals. These side sections are basically going to be the places that individuals are going to be put with a six foot distance in between each one of them. So please adhere to that. It's for your safety. This is not a bureaucratic requirement that I've come up with. It's for your safety. Uh, we we'll also have to be somewhat flexible depending on how many families, how many individuals we have, and how we work this all out. But the way it is planned, as I said, on either side of the main aisle, for families, the side sections will be for individuals. There is some confusion about ministries. There will be a lector at each of the masses. Uh, we will have one cantor and a musician that will be playing, Jessica most likely. Uh, Masks will be worn throughout the Mass by y'all. Um, there are no extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist. No lay ministries, no lay Eucharistic ministers are permitted at this particular point in time. The only individuals that are permitted to distribute communion are the deacon and myself, which means that our communion lines are going to take a little longer. We will distribute at each of the major aisles here, and the ushers will direct you forward. Please follow their directions. We are going to be taking time later this week for training on that to explain to them so they understand how we're doing this. Once again, we're asking you as you come down the aisles to follow that six-foot uh, distancing. There will be stripes on the floor required by the diocese so that you can follow that. And you see them in all the stores now anyway. Exiting the church afterwards, you have to exit through a specific door requirement of the diocese. The ushers will direct you in that way. Once again, Instead of filling from the front to the back, they're not going to empty from the front to the back. They're going to empty from the back to the front, just so that we don't have people overlapping. And we ask you, do not congregate in the uh, commons. Go immediately to the parking lot into your cars and leave. Once again, as a way of avoiding crowds getting too close together, still maintaining that idea of uh, social distancing that is required. Those are the major points that I wanted to cover today, just for, for clarification. The other thing, when you come in here, you are not going to find hymnals. They've been locked away. Uh, we are not permitted to have paper products, paper books that you can use and sing from. Uh, the uh, liturgy books that we have up here, the lectionaries, can no longer be used at this point in time. We're going to have to find some other way of printing out the specific reading for that Mass and have that up there so it's not being handled by multiple people. Uh, when the deacon and I distribute communion, we will be wearing face masks. Also ask, as I did many weeks ago, with all due respect to those of you who prefer to receive uh, on the tongue, I'm asking you please discontinue that for the time being and continue coming forward and receiving in the hand. Uh, it avoids any potential problems. And we will, the deacon and I, will distribute on your hand Therefore, I ask you, make it flat so I can lay the host there that I'm not touching your hand and you're not touching my hand. Isn't this fun? Um, 
The other thing that I wanted to do for you all, once our plans have been approved by the diocese, and that's what we're waiting for now, it's going to take them 72 hours to review it, uh, I would like to have a meeting with the parish, so obviously we can't pull you all in here. We're going to do it on Friday evening in place of the prayer service. And I'm just going to explain in greater detail what the requirements are, how we're going to go about doing this, so that you are aware, you don't come in here blind, you are aware on Sunday what is happening. Uh, which brings up the critical point, what time are the Masses? We're going to have two Masses, uh, public Masses, on Sunday morning, one at 8.30, another at 11.30. We're still doing live streaming. The live streamed Mass will take place on Saturday evening at 5 o'clock. So uh, 5 o'clock on Saturday evening, a live stream Mass, not a public Mass. On Sunday morning, 8.30, then again at 11.30, we will have our two public Masses for you all that you can attend. In time, hopefully, we're going to be able to expand those out and we begin to hit our normal schedule like we've had before. But right now, we're uh, limited on this. Uh, part of the reason is that we have to have time in between each of the masses to wipe down all of the pews, all of the flat surfaces, anything that possibly was touched with uh, sanitizing solutions. And that is going to take some time. So ahead of time, I thank you for your cooperation and your patience with this. So. May you all have a very blessed, a very peace-filled day.